Here we go. Okay. Go live. All right. I think we are live. Good morning, Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Jinx. Good morning. Welcome, we Welcome back. We had a uh, fabulous, fabulous talk this morning by Caitlin Reinhardt's on trees in winter and mind blown all over the place. Uh, just crazy, crazy, crazy things about trees and adapting to winter and freezing. And, and uh, so I uh, hope you're able to join us for that. If not, uh, I encourage you to uh, check out the UEC in my backyard and uh, also join us for those Friday morning lectures. But here today, Ethan, what are we doing today? Yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Ethan Bott and we are uh, very excited to uh, uh, start our December Yardversity event. And our theme for the month is uh, winter trees. And so over the next hour and 15 minutes, we're gonna be talking about trees, trees in winter. Um, and we're gonna be collecting data on, on trees in your backyard. Uh, the goal of Yardversity, the project that we're kind of uh, piloting throughout the series each month, we focus on a specific theme, um, a phenology theme, something that's of interest of that month, uh, at least for Wisconsin. And we're looking at winter trees. And we're using the free app called iNaturalist uh, to uh, document um, the, the species in your backyard. And it sends it to this international database where the community and the, the algorithms help identify the species to the species level. And it becomes really good data quality that can be used for legitimate research really around the world. Um, and so I would encourage you all to go ahead and download the free app, iNaturalist, and create an account. You can also go onto your uh, web browser uh, and uh, go to iNaturalist.org. Uh, I think it's .org. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, create an account there. Um, uh, but yeah, again, so the goal of your adversity is we're looking at the, the biodiversity in people's backyards. Uh, ideally across the nation and maybe even in the entire world because the collective amount of land that is in private property in people's yards is an astronomical amount of land and we don't have that much knowledge or research understood about people's yards, right? We know about national parks, national forests or uh, preserved areas or conserved areas, whatever it is we have research going to some extent at those places. But in people's backyards, we really don't know what's going on. And so we're bringing a special focus to winter trees. And so we're hoping that today over the next hour or so, you will go to your backyard and take some photos of the trees in your backyard, of the bark, of the buds. And you may have taken pictures of it before if you participated in this in summer, but that tree looks so much more different now than it did in summer. And so even though you're taking the picture of the same species that you already know what it is, having that phenological record of how it looks now versus summer, while it may not seem like that big of a deal now, over time, seeing that change over time, year after year after year, could be very helpful to research. So I encourage you all, if you're a naturalist, to just go ahead, go outside, go, go find some trees, uh, take some pictures of the bark, the buds. Um, if you're co coming in from different areas of the United States, you may still have leaves on there, pine needles. So I um, uh, encourage you to submit multiple photos per observation for the tree. And I can show you all how to do that. Um, before I get into tutorial for people that have never used iNaturalist, um, Tim and Maggie, do you think, is there anything else we need to go over before we get started in the quick tutorial? Um, I just like to say that I that I encourage folks to uh, you know if if you can get out these trees are your neighbors they're there for as long as you let them be there and uh, when when you think back to some of the amazing things that we've learned if you're able to join us this morning for Caitlin's lecture uh, about all the things that that are happening inside of that tree I just encourage you to you know 
put a hand on it. Think about what's going on inside that tree. Just, just imagine some of the craziness. Um, but also it's really important to, from a naturalist perspective, uh, to look at what your tree looks like in winter. The, what you're gonna be doing to identify it is a little bit different from the summer. Take a look at, at the, uh, you know, what's gonna be the emerging buds. Uh, take a look at that bark, feel that bark. And really this is an opportunity. There's not gonna be a lot of insects. There's not gonna be a lot of birds this time of year to enter into your iNaturalist. But uh, the things that are with us year round, a lot of the plants, uh, it's a good, good to just kind of take an extra special look like Ethan said. The schedule for today, for the next few minutes, I'll go over a quick tutorial by Naturalist in around 10.30. Um, we're going to follow up our discussion from the lecture today, earlier provided by our forester, Caitlin, um, to continue talking about the adaptations of trees, uh, trees in winter and, and things of that nature. Um, and then um, we have our uh, um, a fellow intern from uh, Veronica from MSOE, um, who's going to lead us kind of in the discussion on the uh, communication within forests and the, the, the wonders of that. And then finally, in the last half hour, we'll go into some fun trivia, um, winter tree-based uh, trivia, and we'll also continue our discussion um, in general about uh, trees in winter there. So again, if you know how to use iNaturalist, I encourage you to go outside to your backyard or a space that you consider um, a yard to you and uh, start taking photos of trees. For those that don't know how to use it, I'm gonna take you through a tutorial uh, right now. I'm gonna go ahead and share my uh, iPad screen here. Beautiful, that works. So uh, you're gonna come to uh, the iNaturalist uh, app. You're gonna open it up. Um, it's gonna look a little different when you log in than this, um, but this shows Milwaukee right here and some of the observations. Um, uh, if it's your first time downloading it, it's going to ask you to create an account. So go ahead and create an account, and go through those steps. All right, the first thing that you need to know about iNaturalist and the project that we're doing is that you actually need to join our project before you can even start taking, well, ideally before you start taking photos, but you need to uh, be a part of our project first. So you're going to go to that briefcase icon at the lower right where it says projects. And again, this will look a little different for um, Android devices. I'm showing you on iOS, but it's pretty similar for the most part. Um, things might just look a little different. So I'm going to go ahead and tap on projects on that uh, suitcase icon. And you're going to see a list of projects that I've already joined. And, but at this point, you probably have no projects in here and you're going to drag down for search for project named and you're going to type in yard ver city. And there should just be that one uh, icon called yard versity that pops up. So go ahead and click on that. And you'll see under yard versity, it says leave news and about. I'm really a part of the project, and so I, I can only leave it. Um, but uh, if you are um, have not joined it yet, it will give you the join option. So go ahead and click on join where it says leave and you will then become a part of the Yardversity project in iNaturalist. Once you're a part of that, it should then pop up here. Uh, you see at the very bottom where it says Yardversity, that means I am now a part of the project. And now you are ready to start collecting your own observations. So you're gonna go to that button where you see observe and you see a, a camera and you're gonna click on that. And uh, it gives you three options of uh, usually you'll be doing the camera option because if you go to your backyard, you're gonna go ahead and click on the camera option and you're ready to take a photo live and put it into the database all at the same time. So I'm gonna go to camera roll and cause I'm inside, uh, I don't have a great plan to take a photo of. So I'm actually going to uh, cancel here and I'm gonna pretend like I already took a photo. So I'm gonna go to camera roll and we're gonna collect, uh, we're gonna say I took a photo that I just selected. Um, that's obviously not blooming right now, but we'll just say I took that photo just now in my backyard. Um, so ideally we're looking at trees. I don't have a tree example in my photos, um, but the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna click on what did you see where you see that question mark and it's gonna automatically identify it. Oh, I need to make sure before I do that, that I have the right date and time before you ask 
the app to help you identify. Um, so you'll see where it shows me a little pin. It says no location. I'll first need to give the location. It gives me the entire uh, uh, globe. And I'm gonna zoom in to where I took the photo of. And we'll say I took it at Riverside Park, somewhere in Riverside Park. We'll say right over here. And it's gonna kind of give you some crosshairs of approximately where you saw it. So we'll call that good enough. And then unable to find location name. Uh, I think that's okay. Okay, there you go. Yep, I was a little specific for that. Um, and then you'll see the calendar icon and it's blank. Um, right, if I saw this blooming plant today, that would be that would be pretty inaccurate. This was, I think, seen sometime in June. So I'm just gonna pick uh, sometime in June that I saw it. Um, that was likely around when I saw it. Once you have a date and time, the correct date and time that you saw it at, and if you just take the photo in the moment, it will automatically update it to the right date and location. And now you're ready to click, what did you see? And this is where the app will kind of guess at what plant it thinks it is. Um, I am not seeing it here. Um, <laughs> Oh wait, this is, okay, this is probably a bad example to use. Anyways, when you click on this, it will show you the, the, the best, the species that it thinks is uh, most likely. Um, and uh, it will pop up under here, our top 10 species suggestions. Um, and that was usually the most likely case. Uh, so if you take a picture of the bark um, only, it may do a pretty good job at identifying the species just off of that one photo. Once you feel like you have it, you can uh, uh, select that. And if you're unsure, you can go to the genus where it says at the very top, we're pretty sure this is the genus uh, Tropolium. Um, so for example, if you don't feel confident that you think it's the right species, um, so if it's only the bark and it could be a maple or it could be an oak, you're not really sure, um, you can go to uh, where maybe it just says, this is a tree. Because the community, goes on this app as well and helps identify the species, helps you get it to the species level as well. So don't be afraid if you don't know what um, uh, photo that you've identified or the photo that you've taken of what it is. Um, you can change your geo privacy where it's, you see the little globe icon to open, obscure your private. Um, if this is your backyard, um, feel free to go to obscured or private. Um, that means the public, um, can't see exactly where you took that photo. Um, I recommend Obs Obscured, that does a pretty good job where the public can't see, uh, it knows generally in Milwaukee where, that you took a photo, but does, it doesn't know where you took it. However, we still get, the researchers get that precise data, um, but only for uh, the researchers get that access. So Obscured is a great option to use. And then uh, if that tree, um, this is a tough one for trees. Uh, if it's captive or cultivated, um, if you think the tree has been kind of grew up kind of from, from uh, that no one planted it specifically, then it would be no for captive. But if you think the city planted it, say maybe it's in your front yard or along the, um, the boulevard or kind of that strip um, closest to the street, um, if it was planted specifically by someone, then I believe this would be a captive observation. Um, Tim, Maggie, and Veronica, feel free to weigh in if you would think otherwise. But I think if that you planted it or a previous owner planted that tree, it would be a captive observation. And then the last step you need to go is uh, to do is go to the projects and you'll see all the projects I'm a part of, but then just turn on the icon for Yardversity um, and then go back and then click share. The so you'll see that, that we've been using Ethan is that if you plant it in your yard, it would be considered captive. But if, uh, if that produces seeds that produce something else, and then those grow without you having planted it, then it wouldn't, then it would be wild. Okay. So use your best judgment on that option. It does have uh, impact. Um, Cause like we want to look at wild observations for the most part. However, captive observations are also uh, valuable as well. So just make sure you take your data appropriately. 
So you'll see I have the right date and time. I have uh, the captive cultivated answered appropriately. And you'll see by projects, it says one. And I click on that to make sure I'm in the Yard Varsity project. I'm sharing it to that page. That is correct. And now I can click on the green share button at the very bottom. And I'll go to my, uh, to my me. I'll load and you'll see at the very top, it is uploading into the project. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the Yardversity project. If you go to the project suitcase at the bottom and you'll see Yardversity pop up within there. You can see some of the data that we already have collect collected over 500 species, over a thousand observations. Um, and it looks like we have a tree coming in um, from Florida. Um, so trees look vastly different there. I don't know what type of tree this is, but uh, thank you to Jen for sending in an observation quickly um, for a tree. So go ahead and, and take a picture of your tree in your backyard and upload it into the Yardversity project. All right, that was your crash course into iNaturalist and how we are using this app um, to submit data on, on a species in our backyard. So with that, I think we're ready to move into our next portion of uh, the event. I'm gonna stop sharing here. The rest of the team can go ahead and join. Um, so if you have any questions about how to use uh, iNaturalist, please, please use the chat function and I can um, I'll hopefully guide you through um, uh, how, to, how, how to use that if you have any questions. And once again, that was Ethan being joined by myself, Tim, and Maggie, and Veronica. Welcome back, Veronica. Thanks. I had some technical difficulties, but we figured it out. All right. Well, uh, why don't we start talking just about winter trees in general? I know we, we had a, uh, a beautiful lecture from uh, Caitlin kind of talking about how trees adapt in winter and kind of the the process that they go through um, uh, to make sure that the water, because there's water in trees at all times, of any living tree, there is water in a tree. How, what they do to adapt, at least in the climate that we're in in Wisconsin, where we get below freezing in winter, obviously consistently, and um, most plants uh, die off, um, but trees don't, they, they lose their leaves for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, so yeah, I just want to open it up and, and uh, I'll let Tim May or Veronica share any initial thoughts that they had about, about that, about the wonders of trees in winter. So what was your guys' favorite part about the lecture? What was your favorite learning thing? I, so we, we ended this, we ended the lecture with, I, I'm just constantly amazed. The more I learn about trees, the more amazed I am as, as an organism, how incredible it is. I mean, we, we know it's useful for us, right? It gives us lumber. Uh, it's fun to, they're fun to climb. Uh, they give us shade, they oxygen, carbon uh, sequestration. There's a, like, they're extremely useful. But, but when you go beyond that, we finished the lecture with the idea that trees need to sleep. Like they need a period of time where they kind of go into dormancy and rest. And uh, I, I think that helped me think about things like if you think in the tropics with all those trees that are there year round, I guess a lot of us are under the impression that those trees are just because they have light and water and soil, uh, they have everything they need. So they're just cranking year round, but no trees need to rest. They need to like just slow down. And if they don't get that rest, just like people and just like anything else, they'll die. Um, and, and Caitlin just mentioned a few times about how they're not sentient beings. They can't think, but then you just think of what does that mean to be aware? And when you look at the, just the intricacies that are in one tree, and then those, those trees are connected to other trees, even trees of different species. Like I, I'm just constantly amazed. And, and now I look at a tree so much differently. So it was fun for when Caitlin went into all the details. I love the learning stuff. I love learning about the adaptations and the physiology and the and and how they keep from freezing and 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 the water pressure and things like that. But but then you just take it to that next level. It's just so complex. That was my takeaway. Due to the level of complexity that the tree 
was going through to prevent it from freezing, which we can talk about more. But it kind of felt like the complexities in the human body are incredibly amazing and complex and beautiful. But it almost felt like the way that the trees are adapting to freezing weather, it felt like kind of like similar in a sense to like a human body. And it felt like kind of human to be hearing about the tree. I don't know if that, you know, that kind of makes sense. So. I think it's interesting to think about that. Like we all came from like the same ground, like same mother nature. It's like, we all stem from it. So we all share like that same kind of like being and transformation during those season. And I think it's like interesting about, cause Tim, you're mentioning how like trees are just aware. What if like, instead of like thinking about everything going on, like people tend to get anxious, but if you just like feel how we're feeling in a way, just like take care of ourselves like a tree does. I love that. What about you, Maggie? Gosh, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, honestly, the first thing that came to my mind was just going back to college and thinking about how plant physiology was one of my all-time fav favorite classes, and I wasn't even supposed to be in it. Um, and just hearing Caitlin's talk like brought back all of that incredible knowledge about trees like and the incredible knowledge that we don't have yet about trees and plants in general and you know they they have it rough outside in the winter and a lot of us are lucky to have some sort of shelter to to trees are the taller trees are even in more um, direct winds and cold and just thinking about all these different adaptations have been really interesting. Um, I think it's going to be a topic going forward to keep looking into too. One, one of my favorite images came, came from a book that I read and I, I don't remember who it was now. It might have been Dawkins, but it, it's this image is if you take a, take a screenshot of yourself, take a photo of yourself and you have this endlessly long bookshelf, right? And you take that picture of yourself and you just put it on the left. Okay. Then you go and you take a picture of your mother and you put that next to there. And then you go take a picture of her mother. Obviously, you know, at some point you have to rely on old photos and then, and then you got a, a drawings and then we just got to pretend that the photos are there. So then you have your grandmother and then your great grandmother and your great grandmother. And as you go back, it's, you know, you're going to go be going back in time. And then eventually because this is a infinitely long bookshelf, eventually your great, 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 you know, however many greats, grandmother is going to start looking quite different. Um, you're the human ancestors and you're kind of going back in time to evolution. And then at some point in your ancestry, there's going to be something that looked like the, the first mammal, probably a little shrew-like thing. And then if you keep going back, at some point there is a mother who had one daughter that led to trees and another daughter that led to humans. So we have this ancestor back somewhere and you just imagining as you go back in time. So that connection with all life is, is, is kind of crazy to think about, but uh, it, it really just takes away that like trees are just trees. The, the wood, the wood is just solid. It doesn't move. I think it's what we think of. But somewhere in there, there's those life connections that just blow my mind. That's really go ahead. cool. Go, go ahead, ahead, Ethan. No, go no ahead. you go ahead. I was, I was, I was going to move off track, so just keep, keep, keep going with it. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I'm also very fascinated how, like, trees, they, they talk to each other. I'm not sure if you guys, like, listened to that um, podcast I shared with you guys, but um, there's a lot people, like, your scientist initially thought they're, like, for themselves like they just want to survive but trees actually have a very social life and they take care of each other and they communicate um so it's like very interesting they're part of the community but they also think about like other species too like again braiding sweet grass or talking about like the nuts releasing nuts with the squirrels and how that just like sends off this huge effect when they release their when they're i think she used walnuts for example but it's all like connected and i think we've come 
like sometimes you think of the material that comes from tree instead of like the life and saying like being thankful for what the trees are giving us. So it's like interesting if we just think about like the connection that we have, we might appreciate what's around this bar. I have a quick update to share that we have a few observations coming in of trees in our iNaturalist project. Um, uh, it looks like it's from Mary Beth, uh, some silver maples, some in the pine uh, family, um, and the litter up on iNaturalist. So thank you for those observations and keep um, adding, taking photos and making sure you add it to the, uh, the yard diversity project for every observation. So it comes specifically into this project um, so we can use that um, for our, our, our research. And I would like to add that I, I think between Mary Beth and, and Justin's account, uh, her partner there, I, I think they have more observations than any, like combined, they have the most observations in Yardversity. Um, maybe just, just barely uh, over Jen Lazuski, who has probably who has the high, highest single uh, number of observations and, and followed closely by Owen. So thanks to the Crescent family for keep for uh, being a huge huge contributor mm -hmm. and these are really good pictures too i like um it looks like the most recent observation is an unknown species and it's really nice because we see pictures of the bark um and then of the branches as well so i think having like those multiple pictures in iNaturalist will help with id um yeah I'm also jealous because their trees are along the Milwaukee River. So <laughs> behind the trees, you see the river and how cool that is. I think it'd be cool if you almost had like a photo contest with like these submissions in a way. Like yeah. how like artsy can you make these? It'd be something cool to like think about so you could post on Urban Ecology Instagram or something. It's a great idea. My mind is just still thinking about how the within like the cell walls of a tree as it, as it gets below freezing for us that uh, that pure water doesn't freeze until negative 40 degrees and that for any little amount of ice that does form within the tissues of the tree in winter that proteins are created to kind of cap off the hard edges of the ice. And so it doesn't burst uh, the membranes within these cells that would then cause, that a lot of things would have then happened, but that would cause the cell wall to burst. And the and, uh, term is not expulsion, but embolism. That, was that the correct term? Mm -hmm. the cell wall kind of burst. And then the living tissue is just bursting all around the tree and then the tree dies, but. And, and embolism also is, has to do with air pockets. And um, yeah. and I, I, last week, the nat naturalist talk was on balsam firs and, and in the research on that, uh, the balsam fir is able to survive immersion in liquid nitrogen. So it's not that it's just like barely hanging on when it gets 30, 40 below. It's like, it's it's, yeah, this is all you got. I can go much worse. Um, so that, that's where it's, a, that's probably where it's a little harder to make the, the personal connection with trees. Cause we just, we, we fold uh, like an accordion when it gets cold and without all of our technology, we would be doomed. <laughs> so. Well, you can think about the aspect of our mental fortitude, like instead of our physical. So. Well, I still fold pretty quickly. Though. <laughs> no, actually I love the cold. It's, yeah, snow is like the my favorite thing ever. There's like no snow right now, unfortunately. But, I think we're well, supposed I'm, to get some tonight. I'm in Minnesota right now, so I'll be jealous of you guys. Hmm. Cool. Well, I, I know we we encouraged you all if you if you uh, got the emails or some updates to, to listen to the podcast, the daily podcast, which we listen to every day. Um, I think two Sundays ago, they released a podcast called, uh, I, I forgot the name of the podcast, but it was about like how trees communicate. It was on a Sunday and um, hopefully you were all able to give it a listen to. 
Um, if not, we're kind of going to discuss themes from that podcast and ideas that came up and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Veronica and, and uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Yeah, sure. Um, so again, I think what was really fascinating was again, like the communication between trees and how like work together. So like, what did you guys think about that? I'm like giving on the spotlight here. <laughs> One thing I know that that this all uh, it, it it not only from a personal standpoint is it hard to uh, fathom some of this stuff. It, it also kind of flies in the face of what we learn in college, and uh, yeah. you know, in terms of of Darwinian survival of the fittest, and um, you know, we learn that evolution happens at the individual level and your goal is to have produce more offspring or at, at least those that are that you know are, are have the highest reproductive success are the ones that are going to spread and um but but then when you when you take this on a level of of selection on the gene or selection on the community kin selection why would you help somebody else uh, most likely because you're helping them because they share your genes, but there's so many cases where that's not the case and where the group itself survives better. Uh, if, if even a certain individual's trait might result in, in you not passing on your genes. Um, so that just this, this whole idea that with evolution of an individual and this whole fighting for space and trees, but the idea that this huge tree that is so ex established and could do whatever it wants because it's got the power dec decides, again, I'm using these, these kind of human terms, but it, then it shares its photosynthates, it shares its water, it shares its nutrients with this little tiny tree that's growing up underneath it that isn't even the same species. And so to me, that's just the strength of this, it shows the strengths of community and uh, I, th I think you can take a lot of lessons. You can learn a lot of lessons from these communities that have been evol evolving for, for years and years and, and take it to the human level. It, it reminds me when, it, like, when I was in college, it, I went into, into natural resources and, and ecology kind of. And one of the first courses that all students going into kind of that general field take um, we, we all do the same lab experiment and it, it's a competition an experiment on competition. And um, so you have a lot of students in, in the lab and some have, so half the plants are fertilized, half of them are unfertilized. And then you have ranging from one single plant in the big pot to maybe 500 seeds are in the pot. And over the course of the semester, you, they grow and you're analyzing the seed um, which ones are doing the best, which ones are doing the worst. And, and you do see that, that the point of the, the experiment of the lab uh, was that there is competition happening, that as there are more plants, they're competing with each other for resources and it's this mad grab for resources and, and fighting and, and butting up against each other. And so I, it's just interesting that it's, it's like, such a big part of the ecology field to learn the fundamentals of competition but that there's also like a whole nother side that i may not have gotten fully in my in, in through my ecology uh uh learning uh um, is the other side of that they're you know that that they're thinking that they're communicating that they're working with each other and it's not just this this uh, brutal grab for resources and competition. Um, and yeah, no, I agree with you, Tim, that it, it, in the podcast, it, it's, it's that idea kind of goes up against evolution in the sense that, that, that competition is driving evolution and that, that this idea of working together and willing to sacrifice your own good for another's 
species, another tree that goes against the theory and thoughts of, of evolution. And it's, it's so fascinating, so yeah. That's really interesting to hear that you did like an experiment on like plants competing for resources. Uh, did you like see why they were fighting just because like they need the nutrients in that same pot or? Yeah, so, you know, we, we developed hypotheses before like which, which specific pot with what specific amounts of fertilizer and number of seeds was gonna do the best. You know, I, I don't really remember the results of the experiment, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the fewer plants that were, and then that were fertilized did do better. This is the plant with, or the pot with 500 seeds in it. Um, so um, to some extent, there is a level of competition that you can't have 500 uh, trees in a tiny little area growing super, super tall, like that. just not enough resources for that. So there are some fundamentals that are, that do exist and are true uh, to some extent. Because, yeah, I was thinking, I wondered, because, like, in a way, maybe that's not, like, a natural environment. I was like, I'm wondering if you were to allow, like, trees naturally, you plant a lot of seeds. Like, I wonder how the trees in, like, natural nature or a natural environment, how they would deal with that, you know? Because, like, that's something interesting to think about, because we have this talk that's talking about reciprocity and working together, but then also, like, competition. So I wonder how they would, trees would actually figure that out would they like not allow certain trees to grow and say like this is for like the good of the whole community to allow us to like thrive without but it's like what line does it cross so like that's what something that I thought was interesting when I heard you talk about that I think that brings in ideas from like forestry and like we understand how to commoditize like big forest for limber or for lumber production <laughs> We know the exact spacing, uh, the number of species, and at what time you, you should cut them to maximize the value out of all of that. And so it's a very economic, um, capitalistic way that we, we view trees and, and resource production. So, And it's also obviously very, ten, can tend to be a very short-term way of looking at things. And if you're maximizing lumber for you know, the next three years, and then you don't care about what happens after that. Well, you know, but if you're, if you're looking for something sustainable for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, which uh, there are some very sustainable uh, outfits, in, including the Menominee Nation right here in Wisconsin, uh, which uh, has arguably one of the most sustainably harvested forests in the world. And they're, you know, it, it's, they're, they're still maximizing that, that long-term lumber from what I understand. Um, and and it goes away, you know, if you if you think, well, a tree needs light and soil and, you know, and, and water, uh, one of the things is they learn quickly is that if you clear cut and then you give all these little trees all they need, they actually don't do as well because they haven't established these, these relationships, these long-term relationships with the soil, relationships with the fungi and with other trees. So, uh, it, it, and, and, and the woman in this, in that's this that's central to this uh article was just laughed at you know and uh and it, first of all it's a male dominated field and uh, someone just shared with us at, at the urban ecology center that i think the new state forester is a woman um and that's exciting news uh but but she was just she was laughed at as you know oh you're 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 getting too cutesy just stick with the real hard facts and the science but you know if, if you don't if you ignore that kind of stuff you're even from an economical perspective, you're doing yourself a disservice because these things are really important. And then from a moral standpoint and a long-term sustainability standpoint, it's really important to understand these other factors. And I, yeah, I think that's interesting too, because like what, instead of like just taking from like resources like wood, you should be able to find a way to like work together. I saw like, I think, the, it was a, a Japanese tree where they have like a full grown tree, but then they like grow like more trees on that tree. So then they're not actually cutting down the tree. They're just cutting down these huge branches. And then, so it's like taking care of the tree, but then also being able to utilize the, the gift of the tree without completely like taking away its life. So I think it'd be really cool to like 
turn it thing. So how can we exploit it? Like exploit the natural resources? How can we work together so we can both thrive? Like the community of trees. <laughs> and I yep. do quickly want to, oh, Tim, were you? No, I wasn't, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I'm keeping an eye on the iNaturalist uh, list coming in. And I just wanted to point out, um, I'm loving looking at all of these winter trees and photos. And then in the middle of it all, we have a Hong Kong orchid um, coming in from Florida. <laughs> just this beautiful bright blue sky and bright green and purple leaves. And it's just, it's, it's great. Thanks, Jen, for submitting those. And we have beavers. So does that count as a beaver or a tree in iNaturalist so, or both? This is, this, this is a great uh, question. And it kind of relates to what next month's theme when we're going to look at animal tracks. So someone I, uh, submitted an observation in iNaturalist for the project as beavers. But there is no beaver in it. But you see that the, the beaver chew um, clearly a beaver has chewed down this tree. And so you can co correctly identify it as a beaver. Um, there are ways where you can have multiple, like on bird feeders, oftentimes you have more than one species of bird on the bird feeder. And so in that same way, um, if you have a cardinal and a blue jay, uh, there you go, thank you, yeah. If you have a cardinal and a blue jay, uh, you can have two different types of observations in the one single observation. So it's a little more complicated. So we could work on identifying the tree that the beaver cut down, but also we know that a beaver has been there. So um, it can be submitted, I'm pretty sure as an observation, legitimate observation. Sorry, in my naturalist. So very cool, thank you for submitting that. Now we just need some trail cam pics of the beaver doing the work. <laughs> The elusive beavers. That's right. All these, all these lectures and themes from each month are tying in beavers to trail cameras to animal tracks, which will be next month and stuff like that. So, yeah. I, I also love the tamarack tree that was submitted too. That's one of my all time favorite trees. What uh, Elder Leopold called smoky gold is the. Uh, is a, a deciduous conifer, a, a cone producing plant, conifer, coniferous plant that sheds its leaves in the winter. And another one of those, um, actually, I, I think one of the spruces is also uh, that sheds some of its leaves. And another thing that I learned uh, about trees is that the ginkgo is. Uh, as far as we know, not no longer a wild species. It does not have a wild population. It's only found in captivity. We have a couple of ginkgos right here in Washington Park, um, and it's uh, it's related to the conifers, uh, but uh, it's 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 uh, the seeds are naked. They're not enclosed in fruit, which is what makes a gymnosperm a gymnosperm. And so, um, a ginkgo is one of those, and so are the conifers. But they're not they're no longer found in the wild there's no longer wild population i always think of that as animals in captivity but it's kind of like this is a tree that's now in captivity um, so that's an interesting thing too so maybe a last question before we move on based off of a question asked in that podcast do you think that a forest or trees are aware of you when you walk through the forest. <laughs> yeah, I always thought that was like, that was like mind blowing to think about. Cause like, I like to think that maybe so. It's like a completely new perspective, but like when, again, I'll bring up the forest in Sweden that I often go there and that is just like my favorite place in the world. Cause like you were just at peace with the trees and you feel like you're a part of it and like, I feel like they definitely sense you like you're like when I step on moss and stuff like I personally feel like what I'm doing like feeling like the squishiness of the moss and just like I don't know it's giving me this sense of peace and I feel like I want to say thank you so like when I'm being in the moment and like being thankful and appreciative of what's there I feel like hopefully they maybe can sense it sense the love
What do you guys think? You know, it's so hard to not think of ways to sense the world that we can't do. That probably made no sense. But we, can, <laughs> we can sense the world with our eyes, with our nose, with touch, with taste. Um, and, you know, we, we even have feelings that sometimes you can't describe the feeling. Um, and then you look at it from, I've said this a lot, birds and insects can sense uh, ultraviolet, which we can't. So we, we have an idea. We don't know how birds see ultraviolet. We can see ultraviolet if we turn it into a something that our eyes can see. Um, so we have to kind of go back to what, with, what we're familiar with. Um, but, but they can sense mag magnetic field. And I don't even know what that would even mean to like sense the magnetic field. And I've, I've mentioned this before. So it, it does, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's a way that a tree can sense us just in a way that we can't understand or explain, um, at least with our current mechanisms of science. Um, so it, it takes a little faith with this answer, but I, 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 I would, I would, be probably be more surprised if if they couldn't sense us in any way. Mm -hmm. And I think an interesting thing too is like if they if they can sense us, do you think they have like a sense of emotion in a way? Probably. <laughs> yeah. And what is emotion? <laughs> going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think, yeah, because the, there's so many different ways to sense things, like Tim said, and we don't know what other ways there are to sense things that these trees and plants may be able to feel or do. Um, and I think, I mean, adaptations are kind of a way of sensing things, um, whether that plays into like a sense of feeling or not? I don't know. Basically, uh, real life ends are a thing, and we're going to be having uh, first coming coming around soon. <laughs> Very cool. Well, uh, with that, um, I think we can kind of continue having that discussion as we kind of. Uh, have some fun trigger questions uh, for you all, kind of on on trees and, and winter trees, and in between, as we're asking the questions, we can kind of continue talking about some of these things as these questions will bring up uh, those themes. Um, do one of you want to get started uh, with a question, or should I get us started? I'm gonna plug in my computer quick. Go for it, Ethan. All right, <clears throat> the first question is, what is the name of the vascular tissue in plants that conducts sugars and other metabolic products away from the leaves where they are made going downwards towards other parts of the plant, AKA the root? What is the name of that tissue? It's also just so crazy to think from Caitlin's lecture of of a straight line, like she said, a straight line of water. You think of a huge tree that's 100, 200 feet tall and just this like a really long drinking straw, a really long, thin drinking straw kind of uh, that, that line Continu of water that's unbroken all the way to the top. That's crazy. And the way that they, it brings, uh, uh, that it protect, it's more important to bring the, the water uh, up to the leaves and so that's uh, the inside of the towards closer towards the the inside of the trunk um, because water is defeating gravity 100 percent by moving up and so that's a very delicate interaction as when the water comes down gravity is working to its advantage and so uh, it actually protects those more sensitive ways of sending water up by protecting it inside the trunk so that was hmm. well I don't have any guesses yet we 
You could do a reveal, an answer reveal. Answer reveal. Or one more hint. So it goes there, there, it's very tricky. There, there are two terms. If you're able to get it down to two terms, which would be great if you're able to, but then um, it's either xylem or phloem. So uh, it's a big clue. It's one or the other. It's a 50 50. And then you just need to decide which one um, is ph phylum uh, delivering the nutrients downward, or it's a xylem, uh, the term that helps deliver uh, the nutrients down. Moving down is another clue and for some xylem rhymes with sky to the sky. <laughs> and phylum goes phloem. down the flow, yeah. Flows <laughs> down xylem, phylum. <laughs> so that that maybe means the answer is phloem. Phloem. Nice. And it, and I, I think it always goes down, but it also doesn't, we, I think we think of it as going to the roots all the time, but phloem will also go to other parts of the plant that's needed where they're needed. Um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a forester, I'm not an arborist, but um, I, I think that's, that's, it's, it's usually the roots, I think, but can be other parts of the tree. Shall we move on to question number two? Let's do it. All right. Name two adaptations that trees have um, in order to help them survive the Wisconsin winter. Mm -hmm. So there could be a few answers to this, but name two adaptations that trees have to help them survive in Wisconsin in the winter. It's interesting if you ever have a chance to go down to places like Florida where Jen is, uh, just to see how adaptations have, or I guess the pressures of living in different environments have affected the trees, right? So if you get to areas that are super cold and super windy, the trees get shorter. Uh, they kind of, you get these kind of dwarf trees. And um, if you get to areas where there's just a ton of things that can eat you, the trees need defenses like spikes uh, or you know poisons and things like that. And then the extreme for our trees, which probably shapes them the most, is this adaptation to the harsh winters. Mm -hmm. And so, what what does that look? What does that tend to look like? What are some of the ways that our trees uh, will adapt? Looks like Mary Beth is heading out. Thanks for joining us this morning, Mary Beth. Thanks Thank for all the good pictures. Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to see beaver pictures. Absolutely. Well, should we go ahead and reveal? <laughs> we <Yeah>. shall. <laughs> <laughs> so two of the adaptations we were looking for for this question um, were the bark so the bark of trees helps provide insulation and protection. Um, and then also the fact that they lose their leaves in the winter for the most part, um, because then uh, they're not losing as much water in the winter time through their leaves. All right, and you know, I think some of these, uh, these questions are just really fun to, to, to think about um, and, uh, maybe I'll, I'll make this more of a, more of a statement than a, than a question, but, uh, well, I'll ask the question and then we can talk about it. So balsam fir is, um, one of the most popular Christmas trees. It's my favorite tree, uh, because we've, that's just the tree that we've always had probably. And so if we, if we'd brought in, um, you know, some kind of pine or a dug fir or something like that, that would probably be one of my favorite trees. But we, we always did balsam firs and balsam firs grow where uh, one of my favorite places in the world up in Northern Wisconsin. So it's, it's sometimes called a blister fir because if you look at the, the bare, the bark, they're these little, they kind of look like little boils. Like, like you'd just kind of like, if you see something on your skin, you kind of want to pop it. Uh, so 
the, the boils on the trees, if you pop it, this resin does come out and that resin has had so many, so many uses. Um, and, and one of the uses that uh, it's, it's known for is, is with microscopy. So I guess I'm not asking a question. I'm just uh, talking about a cool trivia uh, about balsam fir. So that, that very powerful resin that comes out of those boils in the tree uh, is used for all kinds of human maladies, but it, it's also used for microscopy because it's sticky. And so you can, you can, whatever specimen you're looking at sticks to the glass well. And then as it coats it, it preserves the specimen. So that's the second utility. And then third is that the optical properties in that resin uh, are the same as the glass. So it doesn't affect the optics when you're going through. So because of those three things, this kind of random tree and this random stuff that comes out of the tree is really useful. And it's still used today in, in glues uh, for glasses and even like high, high, uh, high quality optics like cameras and uh, microscopes and other things because of that property that it's uh, the light passes through it the same way as glass. So it doesn't affect the optics. So uh, wow. I had no idea about that. That's really cool. Yeah, that is cool. Um, <clears throat> another uh, interesting thing about winter trees is that in Wisconsin, there are generally two uh, uh, two groups of trees that actually retain uh, their leaves mu for much of winter. Um, kudos to anyone that can guess the general species or the specific species that uh, 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 this occurs with. Um, but for those that don't know, American beeches and oaks, oak species in general, tend to retain their leaves through much of winter um, which is very different from, you know, maple leaf from uh, anything that's not a, a conifer um, that loses their leaves. And, and leaves and, and trees lose their leaves generally, as Maggie said before, to retain water so they don't lose water um, through, through the leaves or through the, the, the ends of the buds in winter. And so they'll lose their leaves to help conserve water. But uh, oak leaves and American beaches uh, don't. Um, and there's something called, an, uh, I think I'm pronouncing it right, a, a precision layer um, that is created when the, uh, the leaf falls off, kind of blocking off the, the evaporation of, of water kind of leaving it. Um, but that, I think from what I understand that, it, that in oaks and beaches, it, it doesn't form and so it doesn't cut off the leaf but in a way it helps because the leaf is completely dead, it actually can't lose, the water still isn't evaporating through that leaf. So it's not losing water. So I guess it's just a different strategy compared to the other maples uh, and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I think also from what I understand, we don't really understand why those trees fully uh, don't lose their, their leaves in winter. Um, so it's still somewhat of a mystery, um, but a theory is that, that it's just a different way of retaining. And on the flip side, why is the tamarack lose its pine or its, its cone, you know, its, its little needles mm. and the rest of the conifers, most of the conifers don't. So that's a flip side yeah. question. That was what I was curious about. Is like a pine needles, like needles, are they considered leaves? Mm -hmm. Okay. Specialized leaves. And in fact, the, the pine cone is also a specialized leaf and, oh. and the seeds uh, develop on the outside of the scales. And then, so when the pine cones, I, I, pine cones are just kind of a mystery. I mean, they're good at like throwing at my sister and stuff when I was little, but like, uh, but when they open up, there's usually uh, the seeds are airborne. And so this, the seeds will cut those, all those little kind of things that come out, there's the seeds inside and then they just, they're swept away by the wind and uh, for, for pine trees and others, they're, they're pollinated by the wind. So uh, they're, uh, and, and, and birds will sometimes take a pine cone or a mammal will take a pine cone and move it away and kind of force it open before it's ready and eat the seeds. Um, but like even ruffed grouse, chickadees and crossbills and things like that. Um, some, 
some will eat the actual leaves, the pine leaves, and some will eat the usually the seeds from the pine cones, which is a type of leaf. Hmm. I've never thought it was categorized, categorized as a leaf. A modified leaf. Hmm. That's a talk, cool. talk. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, it's cool. Right. <laughs> Talking about conifers and, and their leaves. <clears throat> One of the like evaporation of water is a big issue in winter when they're in, uh, for trees. And so um, deciduous trees solve the problem by losing their leaves in general. Um, but conifers, they obviously keep them on for the most part, other than tamaracks, uh, year round and through the winter. Um, but it's actually because the, 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 their individual leaves, uh, the, the amount of surface area is proportionally much, much, much smaller than the surface area of a maple leaf, say. And so it's able to ret retain water at all times of the year. Um, it's much more efficient at retaining water at all times of the year, especially in winter. Um, so this is a, a fun, interesting fact about conifers um, and their modified leaves. It's like somebody's uh, uh, brother chimed into the chat here, Ethan. Looks like uh, Will was also wondering if if pine trees had leaves, and uh, yeah, so they're they're technically considered leaves, um, and then sometimes those those conifer leaves are flattened like the cedars, and sometimes they're round, um, and the uh, the the berries that you get from gin, juniper that makes gin are modified cones, so they're not. They're not berries at all. These aren't these aren't flower producing plants that, that will produce the berries that we think of. So anytime you see those little red berries on the on the junipers um, or some sometimes the cedars, those are actually pine cones just that are looking like berries and producing that delicious gin. Yeah, I think nature is just so fascinating. There are like some like berries that are like poisonous to us, but then other animals like survive on it. You just there's so much to learn about all the different things that nature creates. Looks like Jen had a hummingbird and potentially a gnat catcher. Oh. I would love to see a hummingbird. She's just she's just doing that to spite us and to <laughs> rub our nose in the fact that we're not having hummingbirds. Uh, my mom in the summer, not I don't think nowadays hummingbirds are not here, but she had the hummingbird feeder, so we were able to see um, some hummingbirds in the summer. And they were all out on the porch. So they were really cool to see. I, I have, oh, oh, go ahead. Ethan, you so go. go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> yeah, as an update, we have some uh, observations coming in um, from from Colorado. With we're just getting trees from all different states today, um, where we have the ponderosa pine, some junipers um, coming from there, and um, obviously up in the mountains in the Rocky Mountains, you have different type of trees that exist in that ecosystem, um, and uh, as Caitlin, who provided the lecture earlier today, was talking about like where you see that tree line in, in mountains where like, you know, when you're hiking up a tall mountain and all of a sudden there are no trees. That's basically the line where uh, temperatures can get below negative degrees. And uh, you're gonna have to watch the lecture again to really understand why, but that's basically trees will actually freeze not at 32 degrees, but at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit is actually when they will freeze and they don't have adaptations to prevent that from happening. So whether you're looking at that, that tree line in the mountains or going as you go north or really far south, um, when you hit that tree line, you know then that that place can experience negative 40 degree weather. So that's a fun, what, cocktail fact to know, cocktail party fact to know, so. <laughs> Thank you for sharing uh, those photos from Colorado. Yes, I was just looking at the junipers, and and the thing is that the the pine trees, yeah, the the conifers, 
used to be the dominant tree for a long, long, long time, all through the dinosaur era. And then it wasn't until kind of the rise of the mammals that the flowering plants took over. And then they, and now they've, they're the dominant plant type on by far. Uh, there, there's far more flowering plants than there are um, the conifers, but, uh, but they still dominate certain, you know, enti- like the whole taiga uh, and, and certain, you know, alpine places where it, it, where it tends to get really cold, you still have a lot of biomass and that's important for carbon sequestration and, and, and climate uh, trying to, trying to take hold of our climate that we've got going on. But um, yeah, I love the, love the pictures coming in from Colorado, from Florida. This is really fun to see and to live vicariously through you all. Mm -hmm. I really should ask my dad to get the app so he can post some trees and stuff over in Sweden. From Sweden. That would be great. I love also, I don't know if you noticed this, but Mary, Mary Beth posted her Christmas tree (laughs) all decorated. It is now marked as human. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, what do you say? Should we? Should we try another trivia? Let's question? do it. Let's do another trivia. This I really like the, the photo, our photo questions that we have. So um, maybe for people that rewatch this later, they can uh, participate. Let's do it. Well. All right, Megan, do you want to ask the question and then I'll share the screen? Yes. All right. Um, in order. Are you going to share one at a time, Ethan, or? Yeah, one at a time. So here we so, go. So um, we'll share a series of photos, and we want to know what movie each photo is from. And each photo features an iconic tree or tree scene. Um, and an extra bonus, if you, in addition to the movie, if you can um, name the species of the tree in the photo. Iconic photo or iconic movie. (laughs) Movie and species might be a little tricky here, but give it a go. Now, is is there a clue from before that we said that most Christmas trees? There's multiple trees too. There are multiple. All right. Well, should we? Reveal. <laughs> Let's give it a few seconds because there's okay. a lag on, on YouTube from our video. This is a little harder because identifying the tree, I don't think you can based on it's all dressed up. We can take a guess. Looks like we have two answers and half the same and half different. So one person says Home Alone. Second person says Home Alone 2, which... Oh is correct it's from home alone 2 oh uh, so we'll take home alone that's pretty good um half and point, then half point. <laughs> two guesses for species are uh balsam and pine uh i don't know if we know the answer to this one do we the balsam fir i don't know i i it's it's a big tree <laughs> and those <laughs> tend to be things like uh Norway spruce or, um, boy, I don't know. I wonder if, that, go ahead. What, what was that tree that New York City uh, brought in that had the Northern Sow Owl? Did you hear about that? that uh, I did it? hear about that. I forgot what tree it was, but a Northern Sow Owl was hanging out in the tree. It got transported from who knows how many hundreds of miles away. And then they were erecting it in New York City and they were like, wow, there's an owl in here. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I did not hear about that. <laughs> I, I think I think Norway spruce is is likely for this one because okay. I I, mm-hmm. I think that's the one they tend to use and we don't know what year it was. Bowen's points if you're able to find the exact species through your own research from Home Alone 2. And let us know. <laughs> yes, there is no definition on this one. But All right, good job. Um, to the next one. Yes. A little blurry here, but still another iconic movie. (laughs) 
Tim, do you know this one? I think I do. I think I know this one. There's no way I would know the tree for this one, but. I don't know the tree. So we got Pam and Wilbot duking it out so far. What are their answers? It should be a champion. None yet for this one, oh, but oh, we none yet. Okay, okay, okay. We'll give it another minute. I'm trying to remember where this is in the movie. I don't really remember. We got uh, Oak Tree. We've got uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy Baobab. Ooh, okay. I have not seen Oh, that. Happy 28 is Pam. It's good to know. Thanks, Pam. Um, the correct answer, the movie is Shawshank Redemption. So this is, I believe, toward the end of the movie. Um, it's Morgan Freeman, right? Walking out along the fence. Um, and then I think Oak Tree will have to pass. It is a white oak. Um, obviously, I can't tell from this far away. Um, but that is what it was listed as. So really? nice job. Um, right. And now I need to search for the gods must be crazy to see if I see a scene like that. I, I that that was the longest running movie I think at the Oriental back in my day. I th I think it it was playing for years. Um, it was a fabulous movie. I think it's it's a little outdated now. I'd rewatch it, but it's it's a fabulous movie. Wait, which movie? Shawshank Redemption or uh... Uh, the Gods Must Be Crazy? Huh. Okay. All right, there you go. If you've got any kiddos around, this is a good one. I kind of want to be in that picture right now as I'm looking at it. <laughs> as a human or as a painted human? Ooh, either or. Maybe a painted human. Or as the tree. A human. My kids definitely would know this one if they were here. Lion King. Nice work, Pam. Yes. Ooh. Lion. Oh, is it Lion King or Lion King 2? And yes, Will, this is a baobab. Nice. Nice. It said nice. Lion King, but, you know, we, yeah. I'm thinking it's, I don't know, it's Rafiki's Tree of Life. Oh, oh that's, that's where he's kind of hanging out in there and doing his little thing. Yeah. His little thing. And last but not least, here's a photo actually of a painting that someone did of this iconic tree, perhaps a movie that people traditionally watch every year around this time. This is our last question. So if you have an and so at, we are also ending our data collection at the same time. So please get your uh, dot or documentation and observations of trees in your backyard um, into the iNaturalist project so we can continue tracking the biodiversity in our yards at all times of the year. And please do join us next month um, in 2021 for uh, our next theme, which will be, uh, at least here in the Midwest, will be uh, animal tracking. Um, hopefully and likely there will be snow here in Wisconsin by that time. Um, and oftentimes uh, animals are active through winter still. And so you can identify animals um, through their tracks and submit that onto iNaturalist as well. And so uh, we'll have, again, have a trivia session kind of themed around that. We'll have a guest lecture from UW Stevens Point uh, providing a lecture on animal tracking. And then of course, we'll follow it up with um, another Yardversity event where we hopefully can find animal tracks in your backyard and submit that to my interest. Looks like Did we have two answers. Time? Did I buy enough what time for answers? <laughs> yes, we have, we have answers. Um, oh. We have Charlie Brown Christmas with a spruce from Pam. And then Will is 
very excited about this one. Um, Charlie Brown Spruce as well. <laughs> so <laughs> since I, do we know what the answer is for what kind of tree that is? I think spruce makes sense. I, I mean, those look like kind of pointy, ne pointy needles and kind of coming around from all sides of the branches. And I don't know. What does the rest of the panel say? I would have to agree. Ethan, what do you think? I think you're the... I, I don't know if I would... I, I would agree too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Pam and Will are the authority, the final word on this. Uh, wrapping up the 2020 season. And, uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Really excited about next month's Yardversity. Join us every Friday morning, except for this this, the next couple of weeks, we're taking a break off, but every Friday morning at nine o'clock, we're on Zoom. And once a month, we'll be back here uh, with guest lectures and guest topics. And Chris Yankee is uh, just one of the, one of my favorite people and super smart. Um, and uh, look, it, it should be a really interesting talk in January. One more fun fact about this actual painting is you can kind of estimate the age of the tree um, based off of where the, 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 the branches branch off. And so this would be year one, year two. It might be a little tough because it's a, it's a painting, but kind of where the branches are clumped, I forget the exact term of where they clump, um, but that's where, that's a, the whirl of growth. Um, I actually don't know, I think it's true for spruces too. So that would be true for spruces that where you have a whirl of growth represents one year of growth. So this was one year growth right here from this tree and this painting. So with that, thank you again to everyone for joining and participating this past couple of days and we'll all see you in the new year. Yeah, thanks everyone. Enjoy. Bye everybody, have a great holidays. Happy holidays and see you in 2021. <laughs>